Hello, I'm Kathy Bissell. Welcome to the Golf Show 2.0. We recently did an interview with a man who has won a couple of Emmy Awards, who used to write for the Dennis Miller Show and for Queen Latifah. What? Me? Thank you. Oh, <laughs> no, not you. Oh. <laughs> Your friend from college. Oh, it's our, Jeff yeah, our guest, Jeff, Jeff Cesario, comedian, comedy writer, Emmy winner. Uh, we had so much fun. It took us a long time getting to the part about golf, so we had to cut it in half. So this is the Se Jeff Cesario, the sequel, where we talk about Jeff's incredible career in golf. People are, people are probably wondering, it's like, I thought this Thank was called the Golf Show 2.0. So obviously we have you on here because of your golf prowess. Uh, oh. <laughs> you know, you did a lot of, uh, you used to have a lot of sports material. Uh in your in your bits and you I did uh, you did a Howard C Cosell impression a lot of stuff what what is your history with golf do you do you play it do you love it do you hate it are you bound I, by it tell us about Jeff Cesario in golf here's my uh, golf arc and I would call it uh, <laughs> from a bad slice to a decent draw okay <laughs> that would be my arc of I started because it always looked like so much fun it's so weird because i've never discussed this ever who would ask me about my history with golf except you but it's because they looked like they were having fun and i was watching tv back in the 60s so i was seeing julius boros yeah. and ken venturi yeah. and uh um donnie miller a beard uh you know frank that generation of guys you know, uh, yeah, Trevino and uh, and um, um, Arnold. Uh, no, because uh, yeah, Arnold a little bit. I mean, oh, I was watching all those guys, yeah, but Tony I Lima, the guys who smoked, and uh, oh. Ricky Rodriguez, and guys yeah. who looked like they were drinking, and you know, they just looked like they were having a blast. I used to love uh, the Pebble Beach Pro Am because that yeah. mixed the two worlds I loved the most. But I loved those guys especially. So I thought, okay, I'll go try golf. And, you know, I grew up in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which especially at the time was at, was the north end of the Rust Belt. It was just yeah. a heavy blue-collar factory town. And so I would go to the – there was a nine-hole public course right near my house. And I would go there and borrow a couple of clubs. And I would just swing. I had no idea. And, you know, because it was a blue collar factory town, nobody stepped up to you to go, hey, you know what? Uh, there's a driving range. Maybe we should go and maybe you could take a lesson or two. <laughs> so nothing happened like that to anyone. <laughs> so I just <laughs> horribly slicing and then throwing clubs because I had a hot temper. And so it, I took that kind of into high school and college, but then I just stopped playing because I was so bad at it until finally I read a book. Oh God, I can't remember what it is. Brilliant book that was right up my alley. And that's where I think golf books connect or don't connect. They either connect with you because there's something inside of you that responds to the method that the person is trying to convey yeah. or, or, or you don't. And this guy hit it right on the head. It was a really, it was like, you know, how to be a good like casual golfer. So you're not going crazy with it just yet. And it was a whole balance thing. Oh boy, I can find it, I'm sure. But um, just just how to shift your balance, how to keep your wrist straight at first, and then maybe get a little bit of a twist to them if you want. And ever since that, I've been able to shoot fairly comfortably in the 90s. Oh, and that's if I good. really put my mind to it, I like uh, on my, at, at my, uh, for my, uh, for my bachelor party, we went on a round of golf. I shot 85, the best round of golf I've ever wow. shot. Wow. So, so, and it was Nothing all from wrong with that. taking the, taking time. And no matter how slow you go, even go slower for me, you know, because you think you're going slow and really you're not. And there's no point in trying to accelerate downward. Just let the, let your body uncoil at that point. So once I kind of learned just those basics and it was, it was kind of the same way I got into stand-up. It was like, do it yourself, but with a little bit of guidance. And that's what I did. And now I really 
I really like the game a lot. I have a great amount of fun. And comics often are golfers because they work at night. And if you're on the road, there's nothing to do during the day. If you're in New York, there's plenty to do or San Francisco. But, you know, if you're in Rapid City, baby, find a golf course, you know, and, and go hang out with the other two comics doing the show with you. And you get in a round of golf. It's also a great way to meet the local celebs, if you will, because a lot of them will golf. They'll come to the first show on a Friday. Then they'll ask you to go play around on Sunday. It's such a social activity that my skills as a stand-up can come into play just meeting new people uh, at celeb golf tournament, charity golf tournaments. They always couple a comic up with a foursome of, you know, local businessmen or something. So, so it's, it's a sport I I really enjoy uh, personally and it's helped me professionally. And what I enjoy most about it personally is that every single shot is a new reality. It's a new (laughs) chance. You could be sucking. And if you just keep that in mind and what, and just kind of, Don't overthink it, but think, okay, well, what should I work? You know, let's get the balance right. You know, then the next time let's get the arms, right. you know, and keep at it. You're going to have fun in that round. And then just one, uh, one word that helps a lot. And that is cigars. Have you been been invited to play in any of the big uh, PGA tour programs? No, I did not achieve that level of fame. Really? You know, you need to have, uh, probably a, a, a fairly noticeable sitcom career, uh, you know, um, or a movie career of some sort. The guys I always think of are Ray Romano's big in that, but you know, he was on television at Frick. Yeah, that. Kevin, Kevin James, Kevin James. The they, they had hit sitcoms, top 10 sitcoms yeah. for a decade or more, um, and movie careers. So, you know, you got to achieve that level before they really think about right. calling you in. Us musicians, you know, they'll use a Justin Timberlake or they'll you'll use Alice Cooper a lot, um, which is really funny to see Alice Cooper standing there talking to somebody about, you know, yeah, airway wedges. You know, uh, it's, it's so <laughs> funny. He, he used golf as his addiction to replace his other bad addiction. Yeah. Out of, and it's, you know, play 36 holes a day. You don't have time to drink or do drugs. Right. It worked for him. Yeah. Yeah, it did. So, uh, but I look forward to a time I, I have been so busy. I had a, um, a daughter later in life and she's, she just turned 15. So that, that, uh, you know, is a full-time job and I'm still trying mm-hmm. to work. So, you know, uh, I don't get out nearly as much as I'd like, but, you know, just going to the range once in a while is just so yeah. relaxing. It's so relaxing. Uh, I love it. You, you you had one of your, you know, you had a lot of great bits. I mean, you, you've, got, you've had albums out. The one that always stuck with me was uh, the hockey, the guy, you, you do the play-by-play hockey announcer. Yeah. Then you, who's going 90 miles an hour. Then you go to the golf announcer. Yeah. And you barely stay awake. And then your, your premise was, what if they got their drugs mixed up? Yeah. And, you know, of course, the golf announcer, he can barely keep up with a guy. Lined yeah, it culminates in the, it culminates with the golf announcer trying to do a, a, a hockey game. And he's he's literally just like, uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, the one guy had it for a while. It is just freezing in here. Could somebody <laughs> so that was sort of the, the general punchline but, of that. But, yeah, you know. but you, you didn't have a that was that was the only golf material I recall you. You have yeah, I never did a lot of golf stuff, um, although I should look back on it and just see. I used to do a bit on um, the fact that um, uh, they need better hazards. They need more modern hazards. Oh, that's that good. Water and sand aren't, aren't really enough. Golfers <laughs> are too good. They can avoid those. You know, I think, uh, you know, like a landmine would work, a uh, tiger pit. <laughs> You know, just walk <laughs> somebody just drops, you know, I, I, I like, I like that. Yeah. Well, anytime we're playing a course that none of us know and somebody hits a shot, he goes, is that okay? And I'll go, yeah. You know, I think if it cleared the pit of Cobras, you'll be fine. He'll, yeah. they, they always go, what? 
<laughs> I mean, exactly. just of, then they go, oh, yeah, okay. I'm pl I forgot who, what idiot I was playing with. Why right, <laughs> right, exactly. Cobra Pit, I like Tiger Pit, same thing. I like it. Yeah. So, uh, so it's what always. Is your, what, is your, what is your, uh, give me your, give me one shot, your career golf highlight, your most, it does, your most memorable moment in golf. Let's put it that way. Uh, I would say memorable this could be either way, good or bad. Uh, this will, when I was, uh, getting married in the year 2000, I was in uh, Minneapolis, which was where was sort of my comedy hometown. That's where I started to do stand up. Okay. And I knew uh, uh, a guy near a guy there named Tom Bernard, who was a, a, a extremely great and successful morning jock. He had the big morning show. So I had done his show many times. I'd already been out to Hollywood and back and forth. And, and so for uh, my as a wedding gift, he gave me a set of uh, bubble shafts, the Taylor, Taylor made bubble yeah, shafts, man. which at the time were like brand new. Hot stuff. And he said, and he was always getting like, you know, he was so, and he was, he's a big voiceover guy. He did Dodge and he did a bunch of big okay. voiceover campaigns. And so he said, just take them for your wedding. Just take them. And we played around. It's spring. It's about 42 degrees out. There's still ice. For whatever reason, I'm swinging loose. I'm just, for me, in a groove. And we get to a hole that had a slight, right at the end, had a slight dog leg right to the green that was a par four. And you could cut the dog leg if you wanted. It was maybe 345, 350. It was a, it was a par four. But, you know, nowadays guys could drive that easily. Oh, but, yeah. but, you know, I'm a comic. So I go, you know what? I'm swinging so good. I'm going to take a shot at it. I'm going to cut it. See if I can hit it about two, 260. If I hit, if I get the right angle, I'll bounce and, and, and maybe stay on, at least on the fairway. So I take a crack at it and everybody's like, Oh my God, that you might, you might have something there. So we go up, I'm on the green. Wow. I hit, hit a patch of ice. <laughs> just over, I'd, I'd hit it perfectly 260. You know, hit the patch of ice and boom, it just shot up onto the green. And of course, I, I two puck from 20 feet for, for, you know, I couldn't drain it, but but it was probably the highlight, the highlight of my life. That's Throw hysterical. The green four. Yeah, so, so don't don't knock spring golf up north. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's one of the good I'll, hey, nothing is more maddening i you know i've played when lakes have been frozen over a little bit but not super much but enough so that if you want to be mad get your ball out onto a pond out of play but you can see it sitting out there on the ice but yeah. you can't go get it the ice isn't thick enough right and there's the ball you know if they just hit it in the water and it went to the bottom you're like oh, i lost the ball but when you can see it yeah, that's that's taunting. That should be a taunting penalty. Yeah. They should have referees. Maybe that'd spice up golf. Have referees. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Referees that's would be good. good. Yeah, taunting penalties and <laughs> yeah. illegal illegal contact. I don't know what that would be. <laughs> that's when the squirrel runs up your leg. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> there's there's no segue for this, so I'm just gonna ask it. You you were the head writer for Queen Latifah. What? Yeah. What's it like to, what do you write for Queen Latifah? Well, she had a daytime talk yeah. show. I had never done a project in daytime. I'd always been late night writer or uh, my own stuff. The only sitcom I'd ever really done was Larry Sanders, which was on cable so you could get away with murder. Yeah. Um, and I uh, had an offer to go write. So I spent a season writing on Queen Latifah. And then it was such a madhouse. It, Think of the most cutthroat activity you've ever come up against. If it's if it's the PGA organizing committee or the way they select, uh, you know, or live golf. I don't know. But you think of it, triple that, and that's daytime television. Wow. I'm telling you, I, I, 
I was appalled at how much backstabbing people were just front stabbing. They didn't care about backstabbing. They didn't waste the time. Get you right in the heart, move on to the next one. It was crazy, but I learned a lot. And then one head writer wasn't right for the job and got thrown out. And the next head writer was perfect, but she moved on because she wanted to get out of the craziness and get her own career going. And it kind of fell by default to me uh, the second season to a place where they said, well, what would you do if you were a head writer? And I told them three things and they said, we don't want to do any of those three things. So I thought, okay, I, I just want to write, you know, I'll be fine just writing bits. And, and then they said, well, we want you to be head writer. So I took it on for the year, but writing for her, she is such queen Latifah is an amazing talent, a real Jack of all trades. I mean, like a throwback, like can dance, can sing, can do comedy, can host, can tell jokes. Uh, so, and she had such a love of stand up. She said, I don't want to do a monologue to start the show because I, I have too much respect for what you guys do. So, she wanted to do more of a Carol Burnett, get uh, five or six funny people around her who can do a character here and there or come out and do a funny little sketch and then disappear. And then she can have her big guests on and do the daytime thing. And, there's so much salesmanship in daytime where there's infotainment and there's, and she had yeah. to handle all of that. But I was sort of specialized in what I call the, the 25 cent bits because everybody else would be working on, like we did a whole parody of the television show scandal that probably cost $25,000 and it was brilliant. Um, you know, it was just brilliant. But then, then like I would do, I did, uh, something co I, I did a bit on her being the the fifth judge on um the voice you know <laughs> where she finally got but they they had they were so they had spent so much money on the show and on the fancy chairs that they ran <laughs> out of money so she had a folding chair everybody else had the big spinning mechanical chairs she had a folding chair that she had to turn around and it was just a commercial <laughs> parody where the punchline of which was the voice, we're finally out of chair money. So things like that, that literally took 10 minutes to shoot, but I thought were funny and she thought was yeah. funny enough to get on air. I did another one. Um, you've heard of a uh, five hour energy drink. Yeah. I did one called 45 hour energy drink. Oh no. <laughs> which was really just a series of five great wig gags. She starts in the office. Um, you know, when I need an energy boost, I turn to 45 hour energy drink. And for no reason at all, there is a boulder in the center of the office. And she just picks <laughs> it up and throws it out of her way and keeps walking. And it gets more <laughs> absurd from there. And her hair gets weirder and pretty shoot. She's running through the lot with a parachute behind her, like training. You know? <laughs> and finally, she's on the flat bed of a truck. <laughs> in the middle of the night with hair out to here, like electrified hair. And she's just like, 45 hour energy drink. Man, you feel so. <sighs> and right then she crashes. <laughs> and, you know, it was just, and and her glam squad, they, that's what they call the, the, the makeup people and hair people around all these famous female actresses. Her glam squad was so good. And so in on the joke and knew how to take it and run with it. The okay. wigs were hilarious and it killed. I did all of those kind of commercial parody things. I did a, a thick and thicker shampoo <laughs> where her hair just keeps growing. And pretty soon she's like, I can't find my way. <laughs> you know? Those are great. I did an air, a car air freshener commercial where, she plays the old lady who gets in the back seat and there's, there's garbage and stuff. <laughs> and you put the little air freshener in the, in the air vent and it's supposed to take away all the scents. And finally she goes, it just smells horrible in here. It smells <laughs> like a rat died. <laughs> and then she tries to get out of the car and it's locked. And she goes, are you kidnapping me? Are you kidding? She starts to beat on the camera. It's so we did all that kind of silly stuff. That literally too. Cost us a quarter. It took, it took yeah. nothing. And, that was kind of my specialty. That's what I like to do. I did things on camera too. I did uh, the the world's limerick champion and I did a bad <laughs> Irish accent and all my limericks were blue and they had to stop me right before I got to the. <laughs> yeah. 
And I did, uh, oh, I did the human emoji where I was in a green suit so they could green, they, they, you wear green, oh, yeah. they can key you into other things. <laughs> yeah. So, And she would just ask me things and it was really funny. Uh, she would say, you know, be happy or come at, But we had written these really weird combinations. Okay. And I remember one of them was, uh, uh, you're enthused, but you have to pee. So <laughs> it was like, so I was like, like that, you know, so, so oh, dear. it was funny enough to like take it a little further than where it was supposed to go. And they, she truly did achieve a sort of Carol Burnett like quality. In fact, we had Tim Conway on doing bits and Fred Willard yeah. on doing bits, and I would do bits, and some of the other cast members would do really funny bits. And and we hit a groove, and then the show went away. I don't know why, because yeah. the ratings were good. Oh, before really we like all before we expire here, you have a new book you're working on. I do. I have a kids book called Fetch about a uh, a uh, a spoiled uh, show dog who goes through a series of adventures and has to run away from an evil trainer and winds up becoming. Uh, an agility dog, the ones that run those courses yeah. like crazy and over ramps and stuff. And the, it's a real journey of self-discovery. And the tagline is find your inner dog. So oh. I'm, uh, I'm in the process of finding an agent, finding my inner agent for That's the book. Cute. And hopefully we'll sell that soon and, and that'll get out there. And then I got a podcast called uh, Strip Mall Think Tank uh, that we're oh, actually yeah. premiering this week with a great comedian named Jake Johansson. Uh, so look for that on Apple Podcasts. It's called Strip Mall Think Tank, uh, yep. where amateurs solve problems. That's the tag. You had you had me at the word strip, so that's a winner. Yeah. They can go. People can go to your website, which is what jeffcesario.com. Yeah, Jeff. You got yeah. Uh, all the characters you've done in the past. Uh, Chet Waterhouse, the great sportscaster. Sure. And Rossi, the talk show host who just doesn't really have yeah. an attack, attack button. But no, Dick Ross is hilarious. Yeah, I did have, it I have one question. Did, did it at first and did it worse. <laughs> I have one question. Have you had your DNA tested and do you know if you're related to Julius Caesar? You know, I have not gone to 23 and me yet to uh well, to I don't know somebody. that they have Julius Caesar's DNA, but somebody must have it. Yeah, I'm sure of it. I'm sure somewhere down the line, yeah, it's a, a I'm not sure that's the Head of the family I really need right now is a guy yeah. who's. He was I, an couldn't, I, couldn't afford, I, I couldn't afford twenty three and me, so I went to Seven Eleven. They had it a little cheaper. <laughs> Jeff Cesario, I'm glad you could take time out of your day to talk about golf. Well, listen, I we did we precious little on. golfing, but uh, um, you're you're great. It was it, it was great seeing you again, and uh, uh, you, you should. You should have your own show, but it's probably way too much work. Well, at this point, uh, yeah. yeah. At this point, you just go. I, I'm actually working on a script with another person, a much younger person. And she goes, uh, you know, they, they, they might need a younger showrunner. And I went, please, yeah, get somebody 35 to run the show. I'll walk in three days a week and go, how's it going? <laughs> if you what have I'm an incomplete do. sentence that's missing the last three words. Please call me. I can probably help you with that. Otherwise, I'm a right. Exactly. Guys, thanks for having me on. It was a guy. ton of fun.